Sante sana am for reading for us uh, God's word and uh, Ken for, for leading us, reading and leading. Just want to make sure that I get that right. Sante ni sana, uh, the Lord be uh, with all of you. Yeah, in the interest of time, we'll just get right into it. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14. I guess you you really need to be creative when you are given one verse to preach from. Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Unlike when there is a whole chapter where you can glean through information and let the scripture or the passage speak for itself, here today, tonight, is one verse, five words, you shall not commit adultery. So brothers and sisters, uh, allow me to get creative tonight so that I can put some flesh into these words without uh, sounding like I'm putting here my own words, but really I will try as much as possible to come back to the scriptures to help us see what the Lord uh, is calling us into. <clears throat> Looked at uh, the previous six, uh, uh, six commandments. I must admit that I was to preach a few weeks ago on one that was quite easy, straightforward to preach on, but woe to me that uh, because I skipped that week, now I was given one that uh, seems quite difficult and hard for me to crack. And I hope that tonight I'm able to bring out the gist of the information from uh, this single uh, sentence here, do not commit adultery. Perhaps all of us actually do not need introduction when uh, you hear that word is it a wonder then it is almost looking like that very commandment has been edited in the modern day uh, we are living in and it's easy to say that today in our world in our country this commandment is almost reading like you shall commit adultery the word not has just been uh, omitted out, deleted from the hearts, from the mouth, from uh, Bibles that believers, non-believers alike hold in their physical form, uh, paper form, in their phones, and people are going out with total reckless abandon, just doing and being what they want to be. They are happy to edit out the word not and use it to their benefit. You shall commit adultery. Brothers and sisters, perhaps you just need to turn your radio on every morning and surprise, surprise, you're going to hear the gospel preached no, the answer is a resounding no, because most of our radio stations, if not all, have turned out to be marriage counseling rooms, marriage one-on-one -on -one stations. The experts who stand in and sit in in these early morning shows, most of them, if not all of them, are either not married, they have failed uh, marriages, they are quite young, and here they stand and sit in national airwaves, preaching the good news of how marriages should look like 
in a worldly sense. Listening to our radio stations and later on towards the end of the week when you uh, tune into your TV stations on Fridays, some of the TV stations, it's almost looking like marriage is on trial. Marriage has been put on a pedestal and stones being thrown all around marriage. You hear the discussions and the blueprint used in this discussion uses a lot of human wisdom, which is simply saying, you do me, I do you. In other words, malipo ni hapa hapa duniani. As if that's not enough, if you turn to your social media and there are as many as you'd want to get into, there is a lot of discussion passed around in reckless abandon. And it almost feels like the sanctity veil was already thrown away or simply it has never existed. Truly, marriage is on trial. And perhaps if you thought this is just a localized problem that is famously talked about in a station one or five, and another one, Patanisho, talk about others and some other vloggers on the run talking about marriages in the comfort of wherever they are. We just need to turn in and look at the celebrity world outside Kenya, in Kenya itself, and the script is the same and perhaps even worse. Maybe the question we should be asking ourselves, God's people, where did we get the guts as a society, as God's people, to start using degrading, derogatory statements, demeaning words, abusive words, in a clear attack? To an institution called marriage that God created and formed and called it good. Where did we get? To call what God formed and called good something bad. Where on earth do we even get the energy to use statements like daughters of Jezebel in an attack to women, men throwing around that word recklessly. Where do women even get the guts to use those words? Men are dogs. Just how and where did the rain start beating us? Those of you in the corporate uh, space, this is a buzzword that is thrown around most of the time. Christians working in uh, parachurch organizations are neither uh, insulated from these words you will famously hear people in their defense saying, Soko nichafu. Itabidi to share wale wazuri onye wako. How did you even make the Soko itself dirty? And who are you looking at uh, cleaning the Soko for you so that you can share? the good ones are there. 
where do men and women get the courage to even throw statements around like, I can have as many sexual partners as I want. My body, my choice, I do with it what I want, how I please, and when I do please. How do people in marriage relationships think that if this doesn't work, I have the option to look over the fence, the grass is greener on the other side. Done and dusted with this one, over to the next one. Brothers and sisters listening to me uh, this evening, I hope then in the next few minutes to deconstruct some of these beliefs uh, in this sermon uh, this evening. Friends, you'll be pleased to know that in this seventh commandment, I submit to you that this is the most grievous and hurting to God. And while at the same time, when this is obeyed to the letter, men and women will cherish one another and have a lasting relationship with their heavenly father. Is it then a wonder that the Bible opens in Genesis with a marriage in between talks and continues to talk about marriage relationship and ends in Revelation talking about that great, wonderful marriage feast that we all should be looking forward to. So then when I say that this is the most grievous and uh, disheartening disobedience that any man or woman can put across on God's face, as it were, then you ought to take it seriously because God himself has talked about it countless times in the Bible. And you and I are left with no uh, second guessing about what we ought not to do or to do. God has clearly outlined these things for us in his very word. See, friends, what this seventh commandment is emphasizing is the importance of faithfulness in all human relationships. And then, because of the emphasis on faithfulness, it is also underscoring the fact that the absence of faithfulness from the most intimate of the relationship that God created, which is marriage, then all other relationships are undermined, will be undermined, they will be degraded, they will be misused, including your very own relationship with God. Well, then God is telling the Israelites from the words that uh, have been read to us in Exodus chapter 20, and specifically now verse 14, is that the moment you break a marriage relationship covenant, it is then 100% guaranteed that you're going to break your covenant with God. Yahweh, who is a covenant keeping God. So maybe then you are here tonight and you are listening to me. Or you will listen to this message later on. And you are saying, Married men and women, mefikiwa kujeni, hear your sermon. You are here single and you're saying, ah, I am off the hook. Verse 14 of Exodus, you may fikir married men and women. 
for the single people on this call tonight. Let me break your heart. But as I do that, I also want to extend a lot of hope this message tonight that none of us sits on the fence regarding this seventh commandment. Whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're considering celibacy, whether you are celib celibate yourself. In our very different states, none of us sits on the fence. We are all equally yoked and attacked on every side by these very words of verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. So then I hope uh, in the next few minutes again, as I said, to help us see all of us, all inclusive, to see God's word, uh, how uh, it talks to every single of us. If you've just heard the word adultery being uh, thrown around, and I have also mentioned it a couple of times now in the last few minutes, what really is this word? What is adultery? Let me put in a simple uh, a definition that I found out on the interwebs. But this simple definition doesn't simplify the fact that this is a big thing, a big word that we all need to take seriously. So then adultery in a very simplistic way, uh, uh, way is to simply say that it's a voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person someone else who is not their spouse. Please mark the word voluntary. Because in the events of uh, rape and the like, we cannot say that that is adultery. This is a voluntary sexual intercourse that married people decide to get into with people who are not their spouses. That being said, again, perhaps single people are saying, you're near married people, let me, let me break it even further down so that you can see the challenge and how it affects all of us. We can also say that someone is adulterous when one, it's a married person having sexual intercourse with an unmarried person. The second way to look at it would be, you are a single person having sexual intercourse with a married person. And the third way to look at it would be, married people having sexual intercourse with people who are not their spouses. One married person with an unmarried person, single person with a married person, then married people coming together with people who are not their spouses. So then I hope that we all see that none of us sits far away from that boundary that we are all touched in one way or the other. I do not want to go further into other other areas that uh, I would have talked about because this is a wide a wide topic that we can uh, actually uh, look into uh, talk about things like pornography, fornication, masturbation. I mean you can go on and on and on about these things. But let me let me bring us uh, back to the scriptures having made such a long introduction that uh, perhaps was quite necessary so that you can see uh, where I'm coming with this. And I promise to try uh, put some flesh into this 
uh, bring some creativity into it so that you can see uh, where all this is leading. So then uh, coming back to the scriptures, what should our view about adultery be? What is our view about adultery uh, in light of scriptures? The first thing that we should learn from scripture is that adultery is sin. Adultery is sin. And this is sin because you are sinning against God, but you're also sinning against man. Let me read to our scripture from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I read from verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two would become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Later on, we look at verse 18, 19, and 20, but let me just read that again. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against this own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Are you not you are not your own for you are bought with a price so glorify god in your body quite a number of things that uh, we can we can see and hear from, from that that finishing uh, that that chapter paul says that your body is not your own you are bought a price so you need to glorify god with your body so then when you commit adultery, you are sinning against God. And we need to take this with the seriousness it deserves that adultery is committing sin against our Heavenly Father, God himself. And like I said at the beginning, that this grieves him because it is simply breaking that covenant that he has put between himself and us. He is one man who conquered the sin of adultery in a better way that we can all emulate. We read in Genesis chapter 39, Joseph, when pestered around by Potiphar's wife, he puts a cross these famous words, how can I do such a thing and sin against my God? Here is that man that we can emulate and know that we can conquer sin because we can say no to adultery. One, because it degrades our bodies it defies God's temple, which is our bodies, but ultimately it is a grievous sin against our God. Second thing that we can see is that adultery disjoins human relationships. In other words, it breaks human relationships. Brothers and sisters, hear me out this evening. Please never give your spouse an opportunity to doubt your commitment to them. Once you break that uh, trust, you can never and will never regain it 100%. Look at the example of one man, David. And we are told David 
is a man or was a man after God's own heart. David commits adultery with Bathsheba. As a church, you've just come from that series in uh, uh, Second Samuel. David commits uh, that adultery with Bathsheba, who is Uriah's wife. And as a way of cover up, David decides to get Uriah murdered or killed in the battlefield. This then, as it were, David, David's relationship with his own sons is almost a mirror of what the kind of man he had become from that adulterous relationship. We see all that spirals down in his own family, in his relationship, and we can easily trace it back to the fact that David never modeled that godly family relationship of a sanctified man who is looking forward to a covenant keeping relationship in marriage a man who completely broke that marriage relationship yet god <clears throat> would later on call him a man after his own heart <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, David had a chance to look the other way. But this is not what he did. Another glance, another look, and even a further inquiry to go find out who that woman was. And this very act brings David to his lowest as a king. This very act disjoins, breaks families in the kingdom where David is the king. This very act results in murder of not just one person, but several people and truly just looking at the very scene of adultery which breaks and disjoins human relationships. Maybe some of us here tonight have already chose that path to walk the path of uh, my body, my choice, to walk the path of I can have as many sexual partners as I want, including the married people in this call this evening. See, brothers and sisters, when you and I choose that path, what we are simply saying, or what we are telling God, is that I do not want to sit under your authority. What we are telling God is that his burden is too heavy. Such commandments where the words not are just appearing. Hazibambi. We are telling God, I want my way. But on the contrary, we are also telling God that the way of the world is way better. It is fun and fulfilling. Yet the way of the cross is boring and burdensome. You'll be pleased to know that the world simply offers momentary pleasure that wins and fades away like a whim. It will only last for a few. But then what you're doing by choosing the way of the world, ignoring God's command, editing out the word not in that statement, 
is simply to say, I do not want eternity with God. I want to YOLO. I want to live out my life right now, right here. Let me read to you again what Paul, no one else, again writes as many instructions around marriage like Paul has done. In the same chapter that I was reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let me read out verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. This is what the Bible says. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor, nor men who practice homosexuality. And it goes on and on and on and on. Here is the point, brothers and sisters, that when we choose our way, the broken way, the way of the world, we are simply not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what the sin of adultery leads us into. That we go down that foggy and bumpy road. We are happy to drive that road at three digit speeds. Whatever comes on the way, it is none of our cares. All we want is to keep going that road, to choose our way. Here is the warning from, from the scripture that the adulterers will never inherit the kingdom of God. As I said, please remember that this momentary pleasure that we get from uh, these adulterous relationships will only last us as long as that opportunity still exists. But they keep drawing us away from God's kingdom. Unless we come back to our senses and repent, you and I who choose that path will never inherit God's kingdom. Allow me to get crude on this a little bit. But when young men and women decide that they are going to derive pleasure from pornography, instead of looking for godly met, mates who they can uh, walk together into a sacred, God-cherishing marriage relationship, then you're simply missing the mark. Hear me out, young people, that pornography is destructive. He hear me out, married people, pornography is destructive. It destroys the hearts and the conscience of those who are watching. What you're doing is that you're fueling up a whole industry that is doing production for this content. But also what you're doing is that you are degrading the bodies of those whom you are watching on the screens, pleasure, men and women, when you engage and uh, pay too much of your time and money into, not even too much, pay any of your time and money into 
pornography content. You are sinning against your body. You are sinning against the bodies of your brothers and sisters whom you are busy watching on those screens. Later on, when Jesus will be teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, makes that detour and mentions that interesting verse in there and says, anyone who looks at a woman lastfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now brothers, specifically brothers, what that is saying is that all men are adulterers in nature it's just the opportunity that hasn't been presented to them. Let me qualify that, that all sexually active men are adulterers, except for opportunity presented to them. And Jesus would have you warned about it right when he's doing that sermon on the mount. See, you have an opportunity to look away, to look the other way. You have an opportunity not to spend too much, if any, of your time on that, that explicit content that is just driving and giving you that dose of pleasure that is lasting for a few minutes. See, what we should be doing is to mourn over our sinful nature, over and over. It is not that men and women need to be mourning over their sinful nature because they have been caught in the act of adultery. It is good that you mourn because you've been caught, but we all need to mourn over our sinful nature, our adulterous nature, because it is sinful, it is degrading, it is destructive, it is demeaning, it is shameful, and it is dishonoring our Heavenly Father. Mourn over sin, not because you have been caught in the act, but because it is the wrong thing that other people are doing is the wrong thing that you are actually entertaining. It is the wrong thing that you will be doing. Mourn over it, not because you have been incognito and no one has taken a note of it. And perhaps this is even happening right in a Sunday service worship meeting people just thinking about the next dose of their high, which girl, which man they are going to walk with from church, which woman, which man they are going to walk away as they are off with as their office husbands or office wives because they have entertained the thoughts soko imechafuliwa wacha tungangane na wale wazuri wenye wako so that we can all enjoy the few who are left but then brothers and sisters is the antidote to this i'll just throw in one there because of time so that we can draw this to a close. What is the antidote? I'll put it simply, that flee from opportunities that are going to entangle you into sexual sin, into adulterous relationships. Please, brothers and sisters, hear me out that there was one strong man who played around with his Nazarene call 
the allure of women never seemed anything to bring him down. This man was even stronger than he once carried city gates on his shoulders and took them to a hill. You know this man, the man Samson. Yet it was a woman's thigh that brought him down. Please forget those statements. Do not even enter entertain them. Statements like, I know myself. I am strong. Oh, this brother is born again. This sister is born again. He or she is harmless. Those thoughts are the slow end that leads you to a sea of regretting. Brothers and sisters, please don't play a Samson on yourself. Do not neither try to be a David. Please think and act like a Joseph. Flee. In other words, what I'm saying in Kiswahili, Kimbia, Kimbia and Bior, like someone is chasing you, flee. You don't know yourself. Don't say, I know myself. You don't know. Flee. So then in conclusion, while you have read and heard all gloom and purely read these are as prohibitive, so as it is, it's prohibitive. And in no way am I saying that, is, that there is a way out of this. The word just says, do not. There is no two ways about it. But here is a chance to bring you hope. You need to see that when men and women honor and love and cherish marriage relationships, keeping this uh, union sacred, what they are doing is to bring into this uh, relationship fidelity. They are bringing trust. They are bringing commitment. And by honoring and loving marriages, couples are able to honor their commitments, respect the boundaries of others, and prioritize the well-being of their own families. Hapa, yutunasema hakuna mambo ya mpango wakando. Praise be to the Lord. Amen.